So after a strong start and some critical acclaim, American Gothic proved to be just too damn weird for the audience that CBS had cultivated. And with the eyeball network short on patience and long on corporate mergers, they wanted to dump everything that wasn't working. That meant this show. Oh, hell. Fortunately though, Remy and Cassidy were given enough notice that they were able to write a quick wrap up for the fans who did stick with the show. The final two episodes serve as an unofficial two-part finale for the show, and leave just enough ambiguity to capture fans' imagination, while not insulting us with a cliffhanger. Selena is sharing her sickest and most twisted fantasies while in bed with Dr. Billy, and all of them involve killing Lucas Buck. Maybe we could just smother him in his own bed sheets. In a daring bit of sexual adventure, we learn that they've been doing it in Lucas Buck's bed. Oh, and for even more of a thrill, Selena forgot to tell Billy that Lucas is due home any minute. Billy is ready to skedaddle, but Selena says she wants to stay behind and kill Lucas. Billy is able to drag her out with him, but not before she leaves behind a little token of her affection, prompting a typically great line from Lucas. Selena, honey. This was not safe sex. It turns out that Billy was there for non-carnal purposes before getting distracted. He was trying to find some stolen hospital records for pharmacist Yancey Lydon and his wife, Doris. She's in a coma, and Yancey can't figure out what's wrong with her without the records. Over at the school, Lucas interrupts a lesson on U.S. currency to drop a series of double entendres and threaten Miss Coombs. Hope you don't mind me breaking in on you. His diatribe about the buck and the Masonic Temple is filled with great Gary Coleisms, and becomes a theme for the two-parter. Gail heads to the doctor because Lucas's baby is growing at a concerning rate. The doctor says he's seen this pattern before, with Lucas's other bastard, Caleb. Caleb was healthy though, so the doctor doesn't think that Gail has anything to worry about. But maybe the biggest thing to come out of this is that the doctor was aware of Caleb's paternity the whole time. At Lucas's office, Yancey confronts him about not holding up his end of the deal, but Lucas gets out of it on the technicality. I thought that you could revive her, not just keep her breathing. I don't remember making that distinction. Yancey said he'd give anything not to lose his wife, and he hasn't. Sure, she's in a coma, but she hasn't died. At least she don't eat much. Yancey threatens Lucas on his way out. You've hurt too many people. No more, Lucas. At the Holt house, Gail is ravenous for meat especially raw, bloody meat. Caleb receives his allowance early so that he can demonstrate how off the deep end he's going with this idea that Temple and Buck go together. Oh shit, he's got a serial killer collage in his room. Merle is rightly concerned, but Caleb promises her that he has clarity and the buck stops here. Yancey is getting his sheriff shooting gun ready when he overhears Selena and Billy talking about Lucas. Selena tells Billy that Lucas can be killed if you destroy his pineal gland, which isn't as random as you'd think. She's talking about his metaphorical third eye. Dr. Billy tells her to forget about murder and heads over to Lucas's. What he doesn't know is that there's a shadowy giallo figure already stalking the house. The mystery person stabs Lucas right in the forehead. Billy finds the body and takes Lucas in for surgery. Deputy Ben finds a trocar, which the head doctor helpfully describes as a hole punch for the skull. Ben also notes that Dr. Billy's fingerprints are all over Lucas's house so he's the prime suspect. On his deathbed, Lucas asks for Caleb to be brought to him. Caleb has developed a severe case of creepy kid syndrome though, repeating Novus Ordo Seclorum in the mirror and threatening Dr. Billy. Evening, Dr. Pale. Caleb somehow knows everything about Selena and Billy, including Selena's desire to have Billy kill Lucas. Caleb comes to see Lucas, but it's just to say goodbye. Lucas dies after some Latin bonding with Caleb. At Lucas's funeral, we get a number of callbacks, including Bertie, who benefited from Lucas's dealings, and Waylon Flood, who lost a hand. So you see how the town is fiercely divided over his death. Gail is despondent over how much she loved Lucas, which is a line that would make a lot more sense if they had ever gotten around to telling the reincarnated lover's backstory. An unsympathetic Selena tells her to put a sock in it and promises to kill Gail's baby. And she is really possessive. Merlin seems more apprehensive than relieved, so we know that this isn't such a good thing. In the aftermath, Yancey prepares to euthanize his wife, but she's already gone. Merlin happens to be there though, and gives Yancey and Doris a bittersweet ending and a chance to say goodbye. Deputy Ben visits Dr. Billy in his cell and confronts him with a book found near Lucas's house. 
Yeah. It's Yancey's book of Wordsworth poems that he would read to his wife. Before they can arrest him, though, Yancey has already been found by Caleb. My daddy sent me. They arrive just in time to find Yancey literally stuffed full of pills. And Billy has to perform a tracheotomy to save his life long enough for a makeshift confession. Caleb returns to the church and promises that the book starts here. And in the final shot, Lucas awakens inside his coffin. And we're out. The phrase Novus Ordo Seclorum, which appears on the $1 bill and is repeated throughout the episode, originates from a line in Virgil's poem, Eclogue 4. The original line is Magnus ab integro seclorum nascitur ordo, which roughly translates to a great order of ages is born anew. Charles Thompson, a founding father and Latin scholar, adapted this line to create the motto Novus Ordo Seclorum for the Great Seal of the United States. He placed it beneath the unfinished pyramid on the seal, explaining that it signified the beginning of a new American era, commencing from the Declaration of Independence in 1776. On top of the unfinished pyramid is the Eye of Providence, which represents the all-seeing Eye of God, in addition to the original Continental Seal by William Barton. At the time, it was a conventional symbol representing God's benevolent oversight and guidance, but on a more secular level, it represents omniscience and omnipresence, which is why it's relevant here. An all-seeing eye. The show frequently co-ops symbols like this, contorting their meaning, but given the benevolence of the original symbolism, it's interesting to ask, what if Lucas isn't the devil after all, but an angel? There actually is a lot of evidence, especially as Tate I Tate with Merlin on the bridge and the plague sower. I know it's your job to keep people on the straight and narrow. I've been there. Couple that with the fact that a lot of people that Lucas deals with are often done in by their own sin and, well. Help, Ben. Help. There's a man trying to commit suicide in our jail. Of course, in the actual narrative, it represents the fall of Lucas Buck and the rise of Caleb Temple a dynamic that's going to get weird in the final episode. As for the buck stops here, it's a perfectly cromulent setup episode with no less than five possible candidates for Lucas's killer. It's similar to the Dallas episode A House Divided, where a number of red herrings are set up to build to the mystery for who shot J.R. Ewing. Unfortunately, we're in a sprint to the finish here, so not only do we get the mystery solved by the end, but Lucas's killer isn't even Lucas's killer because it didn't take. For me, Selena continues to be the most compelling character of the bunch because she seems to be playing both sides. But ultimately, she's seduced by part of Lucas's spirit, something that will, again, get weird in the final episode. But that is another story. Oh.